Thank you very much. The um, second award goes to a surgical science paper, Cervical Spine Clearance Protocols in Level 1, 2, and 3 Trauma Centers in California. The lead author, Dr. Marat Pekmezji, will uh, present. Dr. Pekmezji. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank NASA and the Spine Journal for recognizing our work, and I also uh, would like to acknowledge my co-authors for their hard work to uh, perform the study. So uh, we don't have any disclosures related to this project, um, as it involves mainly the uh, cervical spinal clearance protocols. And I think it's a timely presentation then if Dr. Kerrigan is doing a uh, performing per first aid only an hour ago, he was probably thinking about um, these principles. Um, so that patient probably had a 4% incidence of cervical spine injury uh, during that uh, traffic accident, uh, and the associated spinal instability rate may go up to 43%. Uh, but our main concern is the rate of neurologic deficit secondary to unrecognized spine injuries, and this has been uh, reported uh, about uh, to be around 0.03%. Although this may seem to be a really low um, percentage. If you consider the emergency department visits in California only in 2009, which was 52,000, that this translates into about 15 patients uh, who sustained um, cervical uh, neurologic injury secondary to an unrecognized uh, cervical spine injury. This comes with a cost to the patient and the society. So the average cost of a uh, patient with a cervical spine injury ranges from two to $4.5 million. And there's also a cost of uh, litigation uh, that is reflected to the surgeon, which averages around $3 million. Um, again, these injuries may uh, uh, result in significant cost to the society uh, with medical care and litigation. And if we sum it up, it may reach to about $90 million only in one year to the state of California. If you extrapolate this data to the United States, this may reach to almost a billion dollars a year. So in order to prevent this adverse event, um, cervical spine clearance protocols have been developed. Uh, the goals were to improve the evolution of patients at high risk, uh, decrease, and ideally eliminate the missed injuries, standardize the clearance process, uh, and two uh, groups, the Eastern Association for Surgery of the Trauma has published guidelines, as well as recently the American Association of Neurological Surgeons uh, published guidelines. Um, at the same time, not only having a guideline is not adequate, the protocols should be up to date. For example, in 2000, uh, according to the EAST recommendations, flexion, flexion extension views were recommended in optounded patients to clear the C-spine following a negative CT scan. Uh, and this is an example from a paper. This patient has been cleared based on this x-ray uh, and then unfortunately presented with a missed injury and he was uh, quadriplegic. So with further evidence building up, in 2009, East revised their recommendations and now flexion extension views in odontic patients are contraindicated. So our hypothesis is that uh, there, there's a lack of consistency in C-spine clearance protocols even at designated trauma centers. And our purpose was to evaluate the cervical spine clearance practice in trauma centers in the state of California. Um, our aim was, again, to look for uh, the presence of an official cervical spine clearance protocol and to compare the, this official protocol with the latest EAST guidelines. We identified the uh, trauma centers in the state of, state of California through the Trauma Managers Association of California, as well as the State of California EMS Authority, and then we contacted contacted the trauma managers through phone and email and asked them if they have an official protocol. Once we received the protocols, uh, we reviewed them for uh, four questions. We, these are the four common scenarios that we see in clinical practice. The first one was uh, the method that they used to identify patients who may not require even imaging to clear the cervical spine following blood, blood trauma, which we called clinical clearance. Number two, if a patient required radiographic imaging, what was the first li line of imaging that they recommended in their guidelines? The third question was, following a negative CT scan in an alert awake patient with persistent neck pain, uh, what was the next course of action? And the finally is the million dollar question, how would you manage the obdontic patient? And once we answered all these questions, we uh, compared the answers with the most recent EAST guidelines. So here are results. Uh, out of uh, 56 trauma centers, only 35 trauma centers had a protocol, a written official protocol, uh, which corresponds to uh, for 63% uh, um, uh, having a protocol rate. 
The level one trauma centers had a higher rate of having an official protocol than the level two and level threes. When we look at the first question, which is the clinical clearance, uh, the, the most common answer was uh, using the nexus criteria with active range of motion. If you add the nexus criteria itself as well, the rate was going up to 83% in the level ones, uh, about 61% in level twos, uh, and 66% in level threes. But this is nexus criteria as well as active range of motion is the recommended clinical clearance pathway uh, by East as well as the American Association of uh, Neurological Surgeons. The second question, if the patient doesn't meet the ne nexus criteria or if they have pain or tenders in their neck, which line of image, what is your first line of imaging? Nexus recommends the CT scan, and they recommend, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not Nexus, but EAST recommends CT scan as the first line of imaging, and they actually recommend against use of x-rays in clearance of the cervical spines. Uh, and our review revealed that 67% of the level one centers and 56% of the level two centers uh, followed this recommendation. Unfortunately, none of the level three centers uh, had this recommendation. And Next question is, you have the CT scan, it is negative, but the patient is still having neck pain. What would you do next? And there are many answers to this uh, question. The recommendations range from you can DC the heart color um, based on the negative CT scan. You can keep the heart color and have the patient follow up in the clinic in a week. Or you can get an MRI at the emergency department as well as uh, or getting flexion extension views. Um, the, Level, uh, about 42% of the level one and 39% of the level two centers had this option um, perfectly matching. Um, but if you add all the possible uh, uh, options, this rate went up to 92% for the level ones and 78% for the level twos. And the last question is the optanted patients. Should we get a CT scan only? Should we get CT and MRI? Should we just leave the heart color on? The majority of the or I, should, I shouldn't say majority. For level one centers, they were split between CT and MRI versus CT only. Level two centers had slight predominance on the CT and MRI. And according to the EAST criteria, uh, you can either leave the color on, you can uh, clear the C-spine based on the CT only, or you can get an additional MRI. If you were to comp our uh, results show that when we compare these results with the current guidelines, um, with regard to the clinical clearance, only 50% uh, of the level one centers were following the EAST guidelines, whereas 33% of the level two centers. Um, um, and with regard to first line imaging, 67% was um, of the level ones were following uh, the current protocols, and level twos were only 56%. In total. Level one centers, 75% of the level one centers had um, protocols that are up to date, uh, whereas it went down to 60% in level two centers and went, unfortunately went down to 17% in the level three centers. If we compare this, the California data, the current study with uh, historical data from 1999, uh, Grossman et al. performed a similar project. And as you can see, California is doing uh, a little better when compared to that data. And we actually uh, reviewed all the level one centers in the US, and our results show that only 57% of level one trauma centers had an official protocol. So California is doing much better than the majority of the level one centers um, in, in the US. Um, and the level two centers are on par with the level one centers nationwide. Um, again, when we compare the California data with the nationwide data, uh, the Calif with regard to Nexus, plus range of motion. Unfortunately, we are falling a little behind the uh, nationwide uh, recommendations uh, in the other level one trauma centers. With regard to uh, first line imaging, the rates are similar, 67% uh, versus 60%. And for the options three and four, they are similar. Overall, uh, the uh, level one centers in California uh, correspond reasonably well uh, with the level one nations in uh, level one centers across the nation. Uh, unfortunately, the level two centers uh, are falling a little behind with 60%. So in summary, 63% of the trauma centers in California had an official protocol, and only half of them were up to date. Um, 
the importance of the difference between um, uh, level one and level two centers is that uh, only 35% of the blunt trauma patients are initially evaluated at level one centers, whereas two-thirds of them are actually evaluated at uh, level two centers. Therefore, uh, we need to encourage uh, the use, routine use of standard protocols based on the latest medical evidence um, to uh, encourage uh, better uh, patient care. So I, I'd like to, again, acknowledge all of my co-authors and um, all of my um, uh, mentors and colleagues that uh, had uh, helped me throughout my career so far. Um, I was, I'm early in my career. This is my sixth year as an attending, uh, and I was just looking back. I just finished my, it's been 20 years since I started medical school, and it's been a, it's been a long journey. And I'd like to thank everybody who participated in my uh, development as a surgeon, uh, and a special thanks to my uh, Dr. Yazidji from my residency who gave me the essentials of doing research. Dr. Chill, who was my colleague, always pushed me to achieve better. Dr. Mikla, who allowed me to uh, give me the opportunity to become a faculty at UCSF. And Dr. Vedat Devran, who has been the best mentor, I would say, and the best colleague and friend since I became his fellow uh, about eight years ago. And all the UCSF faculty and residents for uh, inspiring me to uh, achieve better. Thank you.